So, uh, a short presentation. I'm, I'm senior professor of biomedical ethics at the uh, Uppsala University, where I've been working in actually started the Center for Research Ethics and Bioethics here. Uh, so, what I did now is to give you a presentation of what I, uh, after a lot of collaboration in international research projects on, on bio, biobanking or genomics, uh, in all kinds of EU projects and international projects, uh, I have drawn some conclusions regarding how ethics assessment maybe could be done, uh, are done, and maybe could be done. So uh, uh, this is what I do. Um, so my idea is that uh, the main uh, addresses in this is the researchers in gene technology and genomics at universities or at private institutes. Uh, but also research and professional organizations that are looking for guidance and help regarding what they are developing and what is in the pipeline in the future. But also funding agencies uh, and also ethical and institutional review boards uh, may be addressed. So the background uh, for this uh, proposal of a self-assessment uh, guide uh, is that uh, there's an increasing demand at all universities. We have, for example, at Uppsala University, a clear mandate from, from the, the, the university administration that each uh, researcher from master to graduate to senior level are expected to reflect on ethical aspects of their research projects. So when I have a PhD project, so my PhD is, are always required to put together a document regarding uh, the ethics uh, of their research to identify uh, what is at stake and how they will handle those things uh, that are sort of ethically sensitive uh, in their projects. And this is an increasing demand coming uh, actually at all universities. Um, there's also a requirement stated uh, uh, for from different kind of regulatory frameworks for academic institutions as such. And if you are going to do anything that is related to handling personal data, uh, then of course, or include research subjects of any kind, uh, even if you are just doing interviews or focus groups, you are required to have an ethical review and to have a clearance by ethical review boards. So uh, ethics reflection is an intrinsic part of doing science. <coughs> In my view and in my experience, there is a great risk that this ethics assessment becomes a one-time event. Uh, maybe just consisting of ticketing some pre and general defined boxes. Uh, in many international progress I've been in, uh, they solve this task just by having uh, some professor of ethics or someone uh, skilled <laughs> to fill out the form and submit it in. And then after that, it's done. There's nothing that really continues uh, uh, reflection. So this, what we have established throughout uh, the world in ethics assessment is sort of a seen as a fait accompli, rather than as a continuous reflection about one's research as science develops and societies change. Uh, and I think this is a shortcoming in terms of ethics. Ethics should be something that is a continuous process that is a matter for reflection as uh, um, science proceeds, science develops. Uh, and I can give you several examples of that uh, as, as we go on. So uh, in my view, what I would like to do with this ethics self-assessment guide is to bring research ethics back to its roots as a matter for self-reflection by scientists themselves and the communities rather than by ethical experts of various kinds. If you are familiar with Kant's philosophy, uh, then uh, he made a distinction between uh, what he called the determinerende urteilskraft and unterreflektierende urteilskraft, reflective judgment and determinative judgment. So this is a reflective ethical judgment in Kant's sense. It means that you start with the context, the singular cases, what you're up to, and from the science part, so to say, you build something that is a more general valid that can be universally applied. 
There are some premises here, uh, and that is uh, one important thing is that uh, ethics always is about balancing. Uh, you balance scientific clinical benefits versus risk of harm, intrusion of private spheres, and so on. So uh, you, I could take one example. Uh, privacy is uh, recognized uh, as a very important and cherished value. And uh, we have seen uh, within Europe the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which is very much focused on how to protect personal data from privacy breaches. There was someone unauthorized get hands to uh, the data or samples or genotypes or whatever. Uh, if I wanted to protect your privacy, I think the best way would be to ship you out in the middle of the Atlantic and put you on a deserted, uh, isolated island and then leave you. And then you would be private. You could make a living there, but you, no one would ever see what you're doing. You could be entirely on your own. But that kind of privacy is not the kind of privacy that we want. We want to have privacy respected within society, within different kinds of, of uh, collaborations are being part of, of uh, different sets of enterprises, science being one of them, in order to improve treatment uh, and benefits, in order to provide better diagnosis and better care for patients. So one of my premises in all my research has been, since we're working within the area of medicine or biomedicine in general, is that uh, there are some key stakeholders and these are current and future patients. If we make too strict requirements in order to protect them from say privacy breaches uh, or protect them from any risk, we will not reap any benefits with regard to scientific progress and scientific applications. There's no risk-free society uh, and this just must be a possibility to negotiate risks and do that in a secure way. And we have instruments to do that. And I will go through some of those instruments uh, in my presentation. A very important uh, premise is then that uh, patient and volunteers, healthy volunteers from the public or whatever, have double interests or several interests at stake. So they have interest at research subjects as sample donors in biobanking as sources of data. And those interests can be exemplified like self-determination. You do not enroll a patient or an individual as a research subject without their being able to say no. That was the major uh, sort of problem within the, the NASA experiments uh, during the Second World War. Uh, this an old Hippocratic old primum non societa, who above all do no harm, uh, and they have interest not to being harmed, physically, psychologically, or regarding privacy. They grant access to uh, their bodies, to their genotypes, to the data, and they grant it to you as a kind of an agreement uh, uh, as a researcher. And they would like to exclude unauthorized persons from use of the data. So these are important interests, but one tends in regulation sometimes uh, to forget that they also have interest at the end of the research line as end uses of research. They have interest in improved treatment opportunities. They have an interest in new medical products being designed. They have interest in new knowledge, biologic knowledge, genetic knowledge, and they have general research interest. The actual and concrete patients or individuals that participate in, in biomedical or genomic research uh, may not reap the benefits of their participations themselves because there is a long uh, line of development before a product or a treatment can be granted. So they have, but they have general research interest uh, uh, for that thing taking place so that other patients have participated before them 
and now the bit of the, the fits uh, all their earlier participation. So I will just give you the example of this difficult notion of privacy that has been so uh, influential in, in recent years. Uh, on the example of the need to balance, I was visited uh, some years ago by a geneticist. She was setting out to investigate the rule of, of uh, RNA in vascularization of tumors. So she had a research question. She had biospecimens uh, that was had previously been collected in uh, the hospital and stored at, in this case, Uppsala Biobank. So they were already there, and they were there because there's a sort of a tradition and the mandatory uh, task for each oncologist to, when they have a tumor, they take a sample and they ship it so that it can be researched in part. She didn't need to know any data on those samples. She needed to know the sex, if it was a man or a female, uh, nothing else, in order to do, the, do her investigation. So she asked for ethical permission and wrote its application, and they came back with an answer saying that these are very sensitive matters. You need to have specific informed consent from each individual from whom the sample was taken. And then she came to me and she was furious uh, and wondered what was going on. Uh, and we then tried to help her along. Uh, the motivation from the ethic board was that uh, in order to protect privacy or integrity of the patient, uh, one needed to go back and have a specifically informed consent. Suppose now that she had been doing uh, what the Ethics Review Board asked her to do. It would have implied that she would need to get the contact details for each sample, the contact details of the physicians, the doctors that had submitted the samples. And by the doctor, when she had got that uh, information, she then needed to get the contact details for each individual patient and for those who had already deceased who were dead, the relatives of the patient. And you can understand that she felt that it was really uh, true. This was a massive intrusion into their privacy. She didn't need any data. So we managed to uh, write a complaint, an appeal, and uh, to let the ethics review board change. I take this as an example of the importance to reflect on how we assess the stakes, the pros and the cons, and the decisions that, that we make. So we need to reflect. So what I've done in this uh, guide is to, and I will not go through all of it, but I will give you some examples here in the beginning. Uh, we ask researchers, scientists, to identify those current and future parties who may be stakeholders in relation to their research, uh, directly or indirectly. Those who will benefit, those who may be harmed. And in the, you should also identify and describe the interest of each type of stakeholder, interest holder. What kind of interest do they have? Are these related to physical uh, harm or benefit? Are these related to psychological harm or benefit or integrity or whatever? And then <clears throat> the third point is to identify and describe if and how interest may come into conflict with each other. So uh, you, for example, if you have a, uh, a research project where you are going to do uh, animal research, use animals as an experimental model. Uh, they have interest in not um, suffering. They have interest in not being dead. So you have to calculate and make an assessment of how many animals do you need and how can you treat them uh, in a way that uh, fulfills uh, all kinds of expectation at the same time as you are doing your research. So we have to uh, identify the stakeholders, the interest of the stakeholders and how these interests may come into conflict. 
So this is the first talk uh, for each researcher. And then I have suggested that <clears throat> based on, on what I think all of us have been seeing throughout the years in terms of ethics discussion in moral philosophy, uh, consider a number of principles. And I have named, we'll go through some of them just here, the main principles, but also uh, we'll uh, uh, refer to the, the document for further principles. The principle of autonomy is one of the most important. This is not only uh, the Kantian uh, sort of motivation. Uh, Kant explained that uh, the principle of autonomy is really the corner, the major principle. It constitutes the instrument by which we respect each individual as a person with moral authority who's able to make decisions regarding their own uh, well-being uh, as far as possible. So the principle of autonomy is the primary principle. Uh, so the, for each principle, then I suggest in his guide that the researcher has to ask him or herself some questions. And you can add several questions to this if you want, but. Uh, think for yourself, has the research subject sufficient cognitive capacity to understand? Are you working with minors? Are you going to work with cognitively decapacitated or, or, or uh, in some way uh, patients? We have been doing several projects where you, you are including uh, those individuals as well. Uh, and it's important to include those in the research, otherwise you will not have scientific evidence for their treatment. But you have to think about yourself. Can they understand uh, the purpose of the research, the risks and the benefits of the research? If not, is there someone who can act as a trusted proxy? Usually we have uh, parents to give a proxy consent for their children. But we think it's so important to respect autonomy so that we have the possibility if if it's possible uh, from an age perspective uh, to have an assent from the child in person in, who will be uh, part of the research program. There was a time when we had very little research being done on children. And the reason was that one would, that didn't want to uh, impose risk on them because they couldn't decide uh, freely on an autonomous basis, uh, a balance between the risk and the benefits. The result of that was that we have been for many, many years lacking uh, scientific evidence for treatment of children in healthcare. So there has been a major shift recognizing that you have to include children, this is just as one example, in your research, but you have to do it properly and you have to do it in, in a way so that they can, uh, if possible, understand and the proxy consensus can understand what you're going to do. Uh, consider also if you have disclosed all relevant facts, indirect consequences, uh, future consequences, and so on, long-term consequences. Do they understand, and how do you ensure that understanding is sufficient? We are involved in uh, a large uh, IMI project, uh, a European project with the European Commission on the uh, Innovative Medicine Initiative uh, called PREFER on, on patient preferences. And uh, the idea is to have patient preferences to be included in regulatory decision making. The first thing that the regulator asks when you come with something for them and say that this is what patients want is have they really understood what you described for them about this project, about uh, this balance between risk or benefits, whatever it can be regarding a drug? So these are uh, some examples of the main importance. And my idea is that uh, have researchers to go through this. So these are these principles are, are, for you who are scientists, maybe one should explain that these principles are, are not like scientific principles, like when you, you uh, separate something in a, in a column based on, on weight or, or, or uh, size of, of, of a molecule. Uh, these are more like heuristic principles, we call them. That means that they uh, help us to ask questions, relevant questions to the context where we are going to work. 
So the next principle is the, the principle of non-maleficence relating to Hippocratic Oath of, of uh, do no harm. We ask the researcher, are there any foreseen risk of direct or indirect harms, physical, psychological, privacy related, short-term, long-term associated with the project intervention? And try to specify those, <clears throat> to think this through. Uh, because there will be one important uh, basis on which uh, the research subject will decide to participate. The second point, is there any way that these risks may be mitigated? And if so, how? And usually there is a possibility to mitigate risk uh, for the participating research subject. If you can force, foresee them, you can plan for it. Not always, but sometimes it's possible. Uh, is there a possibility to minimize harm while still answering the research question? It might be that there are, is no possibility to minimize harm and the harm might be seen uh, too substantial and then the research cannot be done. But then there is a cost of not doing the research. So this is an important question. Is there a possibility to minimize harm uh, while still answering the research question? We sometimes have seen in ethics applications, uh, we have done a lot of teaching in, in research ethics for uh, graduate students uh, in medicine and in biomedicine. And sometimes you see uh, ethics applications where they are asked by the ethics review board, by the form that they fill in uh, to identify ethical issues. And they say that we do not see any ethical issues at it, in this place, in this place. And then when you start discussing with them, you see a lot of ethical issues that they need to have to address. Do you see any potential long-term risk related to the new knowledge that will be acquired through the project? And if so, how may these be assessed and, and mitigated? Uh, and there are several examples of this. Uh, I can give an example in genomics uh, about gene therapy. When gene therapy came along at the late 70s, uh, beginning of 80s, uh, there was a great uh, optimism and expectation that now we had done the breakthrough so that we could uh, correct genetic disorders by changing the genome. By, in the first instance, uh, uh, not not replacing and malfunctioning, but adding a functioning gene that could do the job, so to say, to produce the, the protein or the enzyme or whatever it was that was lacking. And there was a lot of expectation, a lot of hope on that. And uh, one of the implications was that very early I started on uh, some trials uh, on that. And some of them really went very well, but they were not uh, sort of complete evidence. In some cases, one started prematurely, and uh, it happened that one triggered uh, uh, oncogenes that one hadn't been thinking about. One such example is, is the severe uh, immune, uh, uh, combined immunity deficiency syndrome, SCID, the SCID children. This was in, in Paris, I think. So uh, you need to do a long-term analysis but also be aware that some of these things can be mitigated when you learn more. So if you just block the technology and say that gene therapy should never be allowed, uh, then you will prevent future developments. And what is happening now is that we have several gene therapy trials going on uh, as clinical trials with very promising results for rare disease disorders. Uh, and that would not have been possible if we have stopped the technology from being developed. So risk related to long-term, but also balancing for uh, any benefits. One example for animal experimentation is that uh, uh, you might be able to replace uh, an animal higher up in the animal series from with one in the lower, if that is possible, and still respond to your research questions. So you cannot just select animals uh, out of convenience because you have them at the lab or so. But bringing harm is one important uh, consideration, uh, but it has to be balanced then. So the principle of beneficence and the principle of um, maleficence belong together. Uh, so you need to, to uh, indicate, so we ask the researcher, what direct and indirect benefits, short-term and long-term, may be respected. Mm -hmm. Who are the beneficiaries? 
Who will benefit from this? Are the beneficiaries the same as those facing risk or harm? It's actually been in the Helsinki Declaration an insertion uh, of a requirement related to the, the possibility of doing uh, psychiatric research on, on uh, patients who are not able to consent. And one of the conditions has been that uh, the benefits need to be sort of shared also within that research community, not by the individuals themselves, but within that for the research group in order to be ethically justified. Uh, how may the balance of benefits and research be justified and how is this communicated to research subjects and concerned parties? That's a very important one. And in the same way, uh, what I suggested is that uh, you use principle of justice, respect for privacy, the principle of reciprocity, freedom for scientific inquiry, the principle of attribution. These uh, last ones are related to the sharing and access to personal data uh, or research data, where uh, you need to acknowledge that uh, someone who has been putting together producing data has done a lot of intellectual efforts in order to do that. Data are not just floating around, ready to pick down. Uh, they are the, ref, the results of data repositories are the results of a large uh, intellectual uh, enterprise, and that should be recognized. That is the principle uh, of attribution. Mm -hmm.